My name is Michael Dobbs. I'm a lecturer in media studies here at Victoria University. Uh, I, along with my colleague Val Hooper, will be speaking today about Trump, fake news, and uh, everything to do with them. Uh, my role today, before handing it off to Val, is to provide some historical context about the term fake news and how it's been used over the past few decades. And as it turns out, for a seemingly simple term, fake news has been deployed in a number of ways in a rather short period of time. Now, just a couple of years ago, maybe, it was common to refer to things like satire, particularly American websites such as The Onion, uh, The Borowitz Report and The New Yorker, television shows such as The Daily Show and The Colbert Report, which spawned some more recent iterations like Last Week Tonight with John Oliver and Full Frontal with Samantha Bee, as fake news. And these were perhaps simpler, easier times for everyone when Jon Stewart was often called the most trusted name in fake news because he would uh, use The Daily Show to skewer not only politicians, but also media representations of, of politics and the country as well. Sophia McLennan reminds us that before the recent US presidential election, we actually loved fake news. It often, in her words, saved us from a declining news media, and its consumers were some of the smartest people in the country. In the words of Chicago Tribune reporter Jeff Wisser, Quote, fake news meant comics playing anchormen and reporters on TV, and almost everybody being in on the joke, rather than the online chicanery that the phrase has come to connote. That online chicanery to which this re refers is the spate of false news stories that were propagated online, particularly via social media, during the 2016 presidential election in the United States. Now, one of the most famous examples of this and one of the most widely spread memes on Facebook supposedly quoted a 1998 People and Magazine interview with Donald Trump in which he said, if I were to run as president, I would run as Republican. They're the dumbest group of voters in the country. However, while Trump regularly did interviews with People Magazine in the 1980s and 1990s, there is no record of this interview. In short, Trump never said these words. Despite that, this meme was tweeted, shared, liked, and favorited on social networking sites such as Facebook and Twitter during the election, along with several other fake news stories and memes that were comprised of factually incorrect stories and conspiracy theories, but presented as truth. Now, while this particular example was used to discredit Trump, the majority of this iteration of fake news was pro-Trump or anti-Hillary Clinton. Craig Silverman reports that of the top 20 performing false election stories identified in a BuzzFeed analysis, all but three were overtly pro-Donald Trump or anti-Hillary Clinton. One example, accompanied by this brilliant graphic, uh, was, widely, which was a widely shared story that claims Hillary Clinton ran a pedophilia sex ring in the basement of a Washington, D.C. pizza parlor called Comet Ping Pong. Um, this story gained a lot of traction on the right um, so much so that it inspired one man to travel from South Carolina to Washington, D.C. to self-investigate the claims. Unfortunately, he self-investigated by carrying an assault rifle into Comet Ping Pong and firing his weapon inside. He was later arrested, and luckily no one was injured. And by the way, Comet Ping Pong doesn't even have a basement, so it's a really fake story. Does it? All right, that's fake news, sir. No. Um, <laughs> But this example, um, while anecdotal, demonstrates that fake news can influence people's beliefs and actions in somewhat alarming ways, and therefore has significant real-world consequences. Now, the impetus for the influx of misinformation during the election is arguably, arguably financial, which is something that Val will speak to in a few minutes. But the prevalence of fake news means that oftentimes people are likely to base their beliefs, their opinions, their actions, and their decisions on factually incorrect information. Part of the reason for this is that we, as social networking users, tend to share stories that reinforce our already existing political beliefs, which not only contributes to a lack of deliberation about complex issues, but also intensifies political polarization, an outcome sometimes referred to as an echo chamber effect. Because they resonate more strongly with our already held beliefs and opinions, fake news stories, which tend towards the shocking or sensational, like Pope Francis shocks the world and endorses Donald Trump, tend to be shared more frequently than real news. As CNN's Brian Stelter puts it, they are popular because they, quote, prey on people who want to believe the worst about the opposition. 
So two revelations raised public awareness of the problem of fake news during the election. The first was that a lot of these fake news stories were actually being written by Macedonian teenagers, of all things, uh, primarily to generate profit through online advertising programs like Google's AdSense. The second was that paid Russian trolls, it's always the Russians, uh, were spreading these false news stories in pro-Trump comments on social networking sites and news sites as well. Sort of an extension of dec a decades-long disinformation campaign which were designed, according to one retired KGB general, to, quote, drive wedges in the Western community alliances of all sorts, particularly NATO, to sow discord among allies, to weaken the United States in the eyes of the people in Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and thus to prepare in case a war really occurs. As a result of this raised awareness, social networks, especially Facebook, were often chastised for their lackadaisical approach to the dissemination of fake news. Many Clinton supporters even overtly blamed Facebook for Clinton's loss in the election. Now, while Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg denied the site significantly influenced the election results, and a recent report from Stanford and New York universities actually supports that claim, the company felt enough pressure to introduce new tools to combat misinformation on the site, namely, algorithms that attempt to identify dubious news stories that are shared by Facebook users, and a feature that allows Facebook users to flag news stories in their news feed as dubious, which is a great word, or disputed. Uh, Facebook even partnered with fact-checking organizations, uh, namely Snopes and Politif yeah, PolitiFact, to help confirm the veracity of disputed stories. So basically what happens is if a story is flagged as disputed, Facebook will go to Snopes or PolitiFact, they will say yes, the story is true or it's not true, and if it's not true, you will see a warning like this one come up on Facebook when someone shares a story. So this effort, uh, combined with the myriad of news stories warning of the dangers of fake news that proliferated during the election, cemented fake news, rightfully so, as a legitimate public concern. But since the election, the phrase has been redefined yet again this time by the extreme right in the United States and President Trump himself. One early example of this can be seen in this exchange between CNN's James Acosta and then President-elect Donald Trump during Trump's first post-election press conference. Since you're attacking us, can you give us a question? Go since ahead. you're... No, Mr. President-elect. Go ahead. Mr. President-elect, since you are attacking no, our news not organization, you. Not can you. you give us a chance? Your organization You are terrible. attacking our news organization. Your organization Can you give us a chance Let's to go. ask a question, sir? Go ahead. Sir, can Quiet. you state... Can, Quiet. Mr. President-elect, go ahead. Can you state categorically... She's asking a question. Don't Mr. be Mr. President-elect, can you give us a question? Don't be rude. You're attacking us. Can you give us a question? Don't be rude. Can you give us a question? I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorically? You are fake news. Sir, Go ahead. can you stay categorically that nobody... No, Mr. President-elect, that's not Go appropriate. Ahead. All right. So here, Trump dismisses the entirety of CNN as fake news. And in this example, Trump is appropriating the term fake news, a legitimate uh, issue, and reconfiguring it into the modern evocation of Lügenpresse, which is a German word that means, literally translated, lying press. Now, this term is most known for its use by the Nazis during the Third Reich to incite hatred against groups such as Jews and communists and to discredit any critics of Hitler in the press. But the word Lügenpresse actually has a similar historical evolution to the term fake news. Lügenpresse originated in Germany in the mid to late 19th century and was used in a 1914 book called Der Lügenfeldzeug unserer Feinde, or The Lying Campaign of Our Enemies, from an author named Reinhold Anton. In that book, Anton compared German, British, French, and Russian news in the lead up to World War I. Someone need to answer that? All right. Um, and what he was trying to look at was the amount of misinformation in the news from each of those countries leading up to the war. But it was only after the Nazis, in the lead up and during World War II, repeatedly used the term Lügenpresse, did it take on the somewhat negative incendiary connotation that we associate it with now. After World War II, probably not surprisingly, the word became somewhat unpopular, um, though it was still used frequently in East Germany to refer to Western news outlets, which is kind of interesting. However, members of the anti-immigrant group called Pegida, which is Patriotische Europäer gegen die Islamisierung des Abendlandes, which is a mouthful, or Patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of the West, 
resurrected the term during protests against Muslim refugees in 2015, leading linguists in Germany to call Lugen, Lugenpresse das Unwort des Jahres, or the worst word of the year. Trump supporters and members of the so-called alt-right, which are really just white supremacists, if we're going to be honest about it, further reinserted no. Um, <laughs> further reinserted the term into public consciousness thanks to videos showing supporters referring to journalists covering the Trump campaign as Lugenpresse during a Trump rally in October 2016, and thanks to videos such as The mainstream such as this. media, or perhaps we should refer to them in the original German, Lugenpresse. <laughs> It's not just that they are leftist and cucks. It's not just that many are genuinely stupid. Indeed, one wonders if these people are people at all. <laughs> now, that's Richard Spencer, uh, the literal walking punching bag and president of the nationalist think tank National Policy Institute, uh, speaking at the NPI annual conference. Now, while this criticism of the press is nothing new, the issue that many had with this speech was how it ended. Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! <laughs> now, in case you missed it, I'm not sure how you could have. Members of the audience greeting his, greeted his closing remarks with the Roman or Nazi salute. Since Trump's inauguration, however, because, perhaps because of that connection between the word Lugenpresse and white supremacists, Trump and his staff have instead begun to accuse critics, the U.S. intelligence community, and even entire news organizations, including CNN, of spreading fake news in an effort to delegitimize de them. Just as Hitler and the Nazis appropriated the word Lugenpresse to silence and marginalize their own critics during the Third Reich. Trump himself, a prolific tweeter, has tweeted the term fake news 21 times in the past six months, most of them in all caps for some reason, uh, from both his personal at real Donald Trump and the official at POTUS accounts. These tweets, uh, just a handful of which you see here, often deploy the term fake news to marginalize negative polls, downplay negative reports coming from inside the White House, position the press as the enemy of the American people, and somewhat ironically to discuss how the press marginalizes and lies. Trump also frequently deploys the term during press conferences. For example, during a February 2017 press conference, Trump called any links made between his administration and Russia fake news that was, quote, supposed to make up for the loss that Hillary Clinton suffered, end quote, in the election. He used the term fake news a total of eight times during that hour-long press conference, usually to downplay Russian ties and links from inside the White House. Trump senior staff have also taken to deploying the term fake news to deflect criticism. Uh, press secretary and probably most depressed man in the world, Sean Spicer, for example, referred to the New York Times as literally the epitome of fake news after the newspaper quoted a number of Trump's top, top advisors by name as they discussed dysfunction within the White House. Trump and his staff's appropriation and misuse of the term fake news in place of Lugenpresse allows Trump and his colleagues to avoid the negative connotations associated with the German word, yet still deflect criticism and delegitimize the popular press. As an NPR reporter, Daniel Kurtzleben summarizes, when Trump calls news fake, then, that word implies that the news isn't serving its basic purposes. It means that the story is intended to serve something other than the public good, and that the author intended to falsify the story. Thus calling journalists and news network fake news cements the idea that the press is the enemy of the people, that Trump is the only trusted source that people can go to. Furthermore, Trump and his staff show no signs of deviating from this tactic. A deputy assistant to Trump named Sebastian Gorka recently said during an interview with CNN, that poor news organization, that, quote, the administration will keep using the term fake news until the media understands that their monumental desire to attack the president is wrong. Trump's team also used fake news as an excuse to exclude several press organizations from a press conference held in late February, among them Politico and the New York Times. In a world in which extreme right-wing politicians are on the rise, including, if you want to, Trump, Marine Le Pen in France, and Geert Wilders of the Netherlands, although he didn't do too well today, this tactic should be a red flag. 
It represents a purposeful attempt by the Trump administration to silence their detractors and intimidate journalists in the United States. If he is successful, these other leaders around the world might mimic his approach, which represents a threat to press freedom and our ability to remain informed, engaged citizens. And with that, I will happily turn it over to my colleague, Val Hooper. Val. Um, I'm Val Hooper. I'm an associate professor of the university. And um, until quite recently, I was in the School of Information Management. In fact, I was the head of school for about four years. And now I am the head of the School of Marketing. And you might say, well, how, how do those two link up? There's a huge overlap between information systems, or IT, and marketing. And my background, my practical background, and also my lecturing background is in both of those. And I'll draw on those as I discuss the various aspects of fake news today. Um, I will discuss um, fake news in, in, in certain sections. And these sections are, first of all, what is it? And Obviously, Michael's given you a very good idea of some interpretations of it and the history of it. I'll tease it out a little bit further. And I'll look at the commercialization of fake news. Then I'm going to look at social media and social media's role in the distribution of fake news. And then lastly, I'll look at the consumer, us, and what role we play in the distribution and dissemination of fake news. So. Looking at fake news itself, let's look at the definition of fake news, because I think that is very important. If we, if we have a certain understanding of what it is, then we can decide whether or not something is fake news. But before I even embark on that, how many of you have been reported in the news? Okay. How many of you asked to see the article beforehand to check if it was going to be correct. Okay, so I trust that the rest of you were simply reported, right? Were you reported correctly? Yes, y yes, Leah, yes. Um, who was not reported correctly? Right, okay, now, now, now we're getting a little bit closer. Um, Tim Berners-Lee, in fact, who is, um, started the World Wide Web, and this, in fact, was 30 years ago, Tim Berners-Lee has identified fake news, along with cyber surveillance and cyber warfare, as one of the three big concerns of the modern society, okay, and what goes on in, this, in the Ethernet and um, cyber um, environment. And the UK House of Commons, too, has um, introduced an investigation into fake news. So obviously it's, it's, a, it's a concern, and when you have people like that indicating their concern, then it's not just an entertainment on the side. It really is a big concern. So let's look at the definition. What is it? It's a type of hoax or misinformation that is deliberately meant to deceive, okay? And it's deliberately meant to deceive with the intention of gaining either financially or politically. Now, the intention is a really important thing because satire is meant to deceive, okay? It's meant to make us laugh. So depending on the intention and we approach it with that intention. When we go and see a satire or a, a satirical play or we read a satirical book, we know that it's going to be poking fun. We'll know that, that there'll be a whole lot of misinformation. But when it's deliberately meant to deceive for financial gain or political gain, then it becomes fake news, okay? Alternative facts, whatever you want to call it. And why I asked you about being reported in the press. In fact, Donald Trump and why he has it in for CNN, and, and I'm not a Trump supporter, I'm not against Trump, I'm, I sit on the wall. So I'm not promoting anything. <laughs> but why he got the hell in with CNN was because they 
didn't report him correctly. They would report half a story and then cut him off. And I'm sure you've seen television interviews where the interviewer keeps on harping on one topic and doesn't let the interviewee present his or her full story. So that's why Donald Trump was saying, no, it's fake news because you're not allowing me to give the full picture. So, um, you know, you've got to hear all sides of this too. So, and obviously, he latched onto fake news because if you saw the number of um, clicks and the number of times that they read his tweets about fake news, there was a lot of tweets and, and, and a, a lot of, of um, clicks. Now, other terms that get confused with this is misinformation and disinformation. Disinformation is the Lurgenpresse, okay, deliberately. Misinformation is something that's not necessarily meant to deceive, okay. We, we could be um, sort of disseminators of misinformation, things that we might believe but, and, and we didn't intend to make people believe the wrong things, but maybe we were wrong, okay? So get that clear. And then, of course, it became, it's become a hugely commercial activity. You know, number of clicks on any site converts to ad revenue. So you get a huge amount of ad revenue coming in from every click on a fake news sort of site, if you like, okay? And then you've got these fake news companies, which are hugely wealthy. They churn out fake news morning, noon, and night. Um, and I think they're onto a good wicket, to be quite honest. Um, and then you get the anti-fake news um, companies, like, um, what is the, the one here that you mentioned, Snopes, snopes.com, and FactCheck, factcheck.org. And they, in fact, check organizations and the extent of the fake news or not. Okay? And it doesn't mean to say that because they do that, that the organizations that are disseminating this information um, and fear that their information might be fake news actually allow them to, to check their news. So I want to get on now to the relationship between social media and fake news. Why has it come so much to the fore at this time? Facebook started 2004. It is very, very recent. Okay? Fake news was around long before that, as we've seen. It goes back to um, Mark Anthony's day. Really, very, very long. But it's become so prominent now because of its easy dissemination via social media. So I'm going to look at the social media and see what role has social media played in all of this. Now, social media, and you can include Facebook, Twitter, which is actually a micro blog, all these sorts of disseminators of, face, of fake news. Okay? Social media, the, the underlying reason and intention of social media are to enable people to engage with others, and they engage in various ways. They build social capital through this engagement. Whether it is bridging, in other words, getting to know people over the um, social medium, or bonding, establishing strong, stronger links with people, or maintaining links with people who they know very well, um, maybe in real life and they're far away in distant countries. So for instance, those of you who might be grandparents, okay, en enjoy great um, rewards from seeing posts of grandchildren and so on and so forth. So that's what social media does. Social media also allows you to create a profile. Okay? Now, there, now we start to get into the fake news gray area. Who of us like to portray ourselves as being ugly or doing ugly things or doing things that we wouldn't necessarily be proud of? Okay? We like to promote ourselves in the best light possible. Okay? So, and even 
if you think of young lads, start, sorry, young lads who are in the audience, um, if you think of young lads having a huge party and acting in a, um, an uproarious fashion, they want to impress their peers because that sort of behavior is seen to be um, commendable. Okay? So they're portraying themselves in the best light possible. Now, does fake news not do that? Okay? Would that not be regarded as fake news? The intention to benefit financially and politically? Okay? Maybe if you're a political party, yes, but politically you can benefit socially as well. Okay? So, the social media certainly help us to do that. Now, another thing about social media, it's online, so it's available to many, many, many more people than the ordinary press, and it's available very quickly. And that's another thing about news. News has to be hot, hot off the press. And so the media writers don't have forever and a day to check their facts. And, and try as they might to report accurate facts, by the time they've done all the delving and the digging, the news will be old hat. So they report what they really believe to be the most accurate facts. So we're getting the stuff and we're getting it on the social media. Now another thing about social media is particularly, um, it's particularly the case, and it's been facilitated by the social media, but it happens online, is that our ability to recall things and our ability to remember things has decreased because of our exposure to the internet. Okay? And this is, this is something that one of my master's students studied. So it's, it's, it's not fake news. Okay? <laughs> our ability to recall, to pay attention online has decreased. So we're so used to pop-ups here, there, and everywhere. We scamper in and out, and oh, we don't know what that word means. Quickly go into to Wikipedia, and then we out again and shooting to and fro. Okay? So it's changed our reading and absorption patterns. And because we are requiring information in shorter and more concise little snippets, okay, what could be better than Twitter? 140 characters, and the tweets come, and the tweets go, and we're getting our information here and getting it there, and snip it, snip it, snip it. And that's how we are now consuming information that we receive on the internet. Now, that's an extreme example, okay? But we are satisfied with that, okay? But, and this gets down to the consumer, the consumer of fake news. When I say we are satisfied with that, are we really satisfied with that? Or do we want to delve down further? We want the facts, not just one little sentence. We really want the facts. But we haven't got the time to go digging into every single thing that we might be interested in and finding out all those facts. So we are partly to blame. We consume these little snippets. And obviously the snippets cannot provide you with all the facts and, and the depth of information that we really need. And if you think of something, you know, I mean, we, we, we're laughing at Trump and we say, oh, how serious and, and all these sorts of things. And it really can be very, very serious, can have huge, huge ramifications for us. But on the other hand, at the moment, we are not so bothered that we have delved down into all those details. Okay? We regard it as a passing entertainment. Okay? So that I think we need to be aware of, on top of which we tend to like, we contribute to fake news' development because we like the sensational. We like the salacious. That's what appeals to us. Okay? And I'm, I'm saying us, you can tell it by the number of clicks on those things. Um, and, and I mean, and I'm going slightly off track here, Ashley Madison, the extramural, um, extramural, <laughs> extramar <laughs> the extramarital dating website, okay, 
it, it, when that website was breached, oh, shock, horror, shock, horror. But do you know that their membership just shot up? <laughs> Everybody wanted to be involved in it. Okay? So we like these things. And in fact, it stems from um, something that René Girard, the French philosopher and linguist, wrote about. He's well, he was based at Stanford. He died a few years ago. And his big theory was mimetic theory, whereby we build our heroes up to a point where we want to break them down. And we do that. You think of Kim Kardashian. There was nothing more wonderful than to see Kim Kardashian looking like this beached whale when she was pregnant. Okay? But now she's got slim again, so we all think she's wonderful again. Okay? And, and it's the same with Donald Trump. Here is someone who's not a politician and he's risen up He's the voice of the, the man in the street, you know. I mean, he had a fairly wealthy upbringing, but, you know, apart from that, okay, he's not a, a, a crooked politician. And that's why he, he appeals to the American Midwest, okay. He appeals to them hugely, and I think a lot of others. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, we are partly to blame for the dissemination of this fake news. And um, just as a bit of a guide, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, which is the top library um, organization in the world, and IFLA is, um, well, libraries are extremely fussy about the information they curate. And IFLA gave some guidelines to determine whether or not news is fake. And the first is consider the source. And this sounds like very much like guidelines to academics, too. The second is read the headline. Check the authors. Assess the supporting services. Check the date of publication. Ask if it's a joke. Review your own biases. Now, that is really important. Hmm? And ask the experts. Review your own biases. Know what you, where you're coming from and know what you would like to read about. Know what you'd like to read is funny. And if you think, what would you like to read about Trump now? What would you like to hear that he has said? And to what extent will his next tweets actually satisfy you? Um, and then you can say, oh, how terrible, oh, you know. And we, we want to be able to do that as well. So look at ourselves um, when we determine whether news is fake or not and how we react to fake news. So thank you.